atomic engines. No radiation. They were on the space probes. The atomic, little atomic engine was on the moonshot. So we used P-238. We had those engines. But we hadn't what we called the science call, we hadn't not hardened the circuitry. I discussed this, as I told you last night, I discussed this with Dr. Teller. And he agreed, he told me that Star Wars, still SDI, they call it, they call Star Wars, still hasn't reached a stage where we could harden the circuitry. Outside influence, could, radiation could affect it. Do you believe that the Americans are eventually shooting down some objects coming from the outer space? Well, now we operated, the premise that we operated on was this. We didn't know for sure, like I told you in the incident that I had, where the thing said, I asked his friend or phone, and said neither. We operated on the premise of this. We don't know if they're enemies, we don't know if they're friends. Just in case, we'll be ready. So we developed Star Wars weapons and laser weapons for, on that premise, just in case. After all, if you're an army and you don't do that, you're going to be left behind. So that was our motto, just in case. And also, the general used to say, if it can be done, I think we can do it. But I failed in the Lyman of Adams. The general gave me a special assignment. Fund it if you think they're even starting. My time, they hadn't even started. IBM now is getting into it, aligning atoms. You mentioned Edward Teller. <clears throat> some, are, some are thinking that uh, Teller was the head of all types of research conducted in the secret installments called Area 51. No, that's... That's not so. That's speculation, people. I knew about Area 51. It was it was a no-fly over area because of atomic installations. In my day, that was I was cleared for that. There were developments there, yes, a B2 and things like that were developed there, but in the development stage, and certain items on the B2 are still classified. Yes, when you develop classified weapons, you protect it. You you, you do protect it. And you don't allow the public or general public to nose around. Because even the Roswell, Stalin gave instructions to his top men. Find out what happened there and steal it. They stole our atomic engine, that little engine. They put in their satellites and now they're leaking. Yes, but at the same time, reverse engineering stuff taken from uh, alien uh, objects must be conducted somewhere secretly, like Area 51. Well, I don't know of any. <laughs> I've been gone, of course, you got to realize I've been gone 35 years, too. So I'm not up on it. And for 30 years, I didn't go looking for it. I have a lot of friends who tell me things, yet they, we don't, when we talk, I talk among some of my friends, we don't go by whether I'm cleared or not or they're cleared or not. We discuss the things. Because I think we have the reputation among many of us is we're not going to talk or spread this out if it's important. We grew up in that, in that by that, in those stages. We have one minute regarding who was the real president behind everything. I mean, Truman and Eisenhower, basically? Truman knew about it. In fact, I joined the White House staff in the last two months of Truman's administration when I went in the White House staff. And then Eisenhower was elected already. But Truman was still president when I went in. He knew about it. He knew about flying saucers. So did Eisenhower. So did Kennedy. But you don't put this out in public. Because Wilbur Smith told me, the Canadian genius, he said, of course you people, I'm, I'm happy to know what you're doing. I'm glad you let me in on it. I will, I will not betray the trust. But he said, remember one thing. Don't talk about it because you will put yourself in a position where thousands of questions will be answered that you can't answer. Asked you. And that was Wilbur Smith's words to us. Don't do it because you'll invite thousands of questions which cannot, don't have any answers. And that's still the case. Even today you asked me some questions, I told you there's no answer. I don't know. You asked me who, who made these clones. I wish I knew. I have no idea. I can only tell you what I know and what I worked with. Who made the clone? I wish I knew. How it was made? I wish I knew. I don't know. Hmm.
It's on everybody now. So okay. this interview is just part of the uh, of the interview I have conducted with Colonel Corso on April 13, 1998. But mainly, I don't have comments regarding what Corso stated. But there is a part of uh, the entire interview that pertains to the Italian uh, situation that Corso was facing in those years. And there is one part regarding the scientist and the other part that is not expressed here by Conor Corso. This second part is specifically the activity that Corso was conducting as very important liaison officer for the Allied forces in Rome, stationary, stationed in Rome. Now, with Bob here, what we can do is just having, not from dawn of a new age, but from other notes that he gave me, we can go a little further into this subject that is extremely, extremely delicate. And I want to uh, proceed this with a consideration. Me and Corso, we were very close. Paola knows it, and Paola, she was very fond with this old man. He was very difficult to treat, believe me. I mean, this doesn't appear. It looks like, uh, you know, a normal old man, old guy. Not at all. Corso was a tough, very tough man until the last day, I believe. And these notes will specify why. So we can start. Uh, these notes were written by Cindy Corso under dictation by her father. So we can start. Rome, on June 4th. No, Mike. Okay, hey, we're on. Rome, on June 4th, 1944, was a city of wild, joyful demonstration. The Allied forces had moved in, the Nazis were no longer in control, and the whole world looked a lot brighter. However, from the military intelligence aspect, the outlook was grim. We entered Rome with a long list of wanted spies, saboteurs, and collaborators. Keeping subversion under control would be a formidable task. A U.S. officer was assigned the slot of Assistant Chief of Intelligence G2 of the Rome Area Allied Command and assumed the overall responsibility for security of the area. Counterintelligence until this time had been mostly a British responsibility. It was during my G2 assignment that I met with a formal salute and handshake the Chief of Italian Military Intelligence, General Pompeo Agrifoglio, a man nearing his 60th birthday. Okay. Now, who was this guy, Pompeo Agrifoglio? I went to a thorough research regarding Pompeo Agrifoglio, and this general started this activity, as I found out, from the invasion of Sicily till the end of the war, conducting a very small Italo American group who played, which played a very important part in establishing the relations between Italy, just Fred, and United States. These guys were men of the OSS, Office of Strategic Services. A new, a brand new intelligence, American branch, in, uh, um, in, included in the operations conducted by SI, Secret Intelligence for Italy. 